I will start with a little bit of basics. Um, and uh, just for uh, one thing, prerequisites for everyone who codes along, regardless of whether it is in the Jupyter Hub or on their own system. Um, what you should check right away, you can do this uh, here in the Jupyter Lab. I have it, uh, you should be able to see it in my screen share. The very first thing that you should make sure is that everything has succeeded software wise. So if you run uh, data led dash dash version, you should see something similar to what I'm currently seeing. The important part is this version indication. Um, if you're also seeing this uh, message here, it is highly recommended to configure Git then uh, that's expected, especially in the Jupyter Hub. So what Datalet does to create this version history is that it relies on Git uh, to create these entries and Git needs to know your name and your email address in order to do this. Doesn't really need to be your real email address, but it's also not a bad thing. So what uh, you need to do in order to configure your so-called Git identity is to run a git config set command. You can just uh, go to um, uh, to this. Uh, so you can you can copy it from from my slides, or you can go to uh, set up um, on the, no, it's not set up. Can you remind me where we have the instructions, Michael? Yes, so this is the first module content tracking with data lot, ah. and it's a heading called setting up. Oh, great, thanks. Yeah, uh, this is something which you can simply copy uh, or you can uh, simply type it uh, the same way that I'm doing it right now. I'm giving it my name. If there's a space included, I'm include. I'm I'm adding these brackets here. Uh, oops. Um. <laughs> Let me just quickly copy it. <laughs> I'll be John Doe for the remainder of the session. We disregard the set here. That's a mistake. I'm really sorry. Um, okay, and once your Git identity is set, you can uh, run, for example, the config list. And then it should tell you that there is a username, a user email. And if you then run the version, then you shouldn't receive uh, this warning here anymore. Um, so uh, also a quick prerequisite, we'll be using the command line today to use Datalet and there we'll just use the Datalet commands that we'll introduce here. But you can also use it from its Python API. So if you're a Python user, then you can include this uh, import statement or a similar import statement of your choice in your Python scripts and then have access to all of the commands uh, in the typical uh, Python way. But if you are a user of R, MATLAB, any other programming language, then you can include data led calls uh, via system calls. So if you're an R user, this would be the command to use in order to use data led commands. Um, whenever you use Datalet, you have a certain command structure. And if you're not used to command lines, um, then this uh, might be uh, a little bit new. So we're talking about it. Um, there is a main command and that's called Datalet. And this main command is always the same. And then there's a sub command and that's a specific Datalet call to run. For example, Datalet um, create. Uh, both the main command and the sub command, so for example, create, have options. The dash dash version was a main command uh, option that comes directly after the main command. But there are also options for the sub commands, and they would come right after the sub command. So, for example, um, command the main command right here is data that the sub command is safe and then there are uh, two options here one is dash m it's a fairly common option it's short for dash dash message so there is always a short and a longer version the longer version is a little bit more descriptive but you can 
use either. And then there's a second command, uh, a subcommand option, and that's the person. Um, one very important feature is uh, knowing where to look for help. This is true for almost any command line tool that uh, you um, might be using. Uh, whenever you want to find out about data-led commands or how to use a specific data-led command, there is a dash dash help option uh, for both the main and the subcommands. Uh, if you use dash dash help, then you will find a very comprehensive help. It includes very long descriptions of all of the options. It includes examples. Uh, it uh, includes um, some general notes. If you want to um, use the short dash h option, you will just get a summary help message that shows you which options uh, are available for this uh, command uh, or subcommand. Uh, you can read about this in this short section, how to use data lab. Uh, and um, let's now actually start by uh, creating this main structure, this core data structure, uh, the so-called data lab data set, which is just a directory um, that is managed by data lab uh, and will um, create it, um, but it can also be installed. We can see this later or linked. And um, if you want to code along, then I'll quickly paste this into the chat so that you have it right there available for you. Uh, and we'll start with this sub section here, create an empty data set. Uh, you can see that there are sometimes um, cells that are called bash and sometimes cells that are called output. Uh, when coding along in the Jupyter Hub, just include the bash cells, not the output cells. The outputs contain expected outputs, but not every bash cell has an output cell. So uh, to code along, simply copy this um, command here and paste it into your Jupyter Hub control C, control V should work for everyone, hopefully, and execute any command that you have copied um, by hitting the enter button. Please give me a quick indication if that uh, has not worked for someone. Could you resend the link again in the chat so we Yes. Because it didn't arrive in the, I mean, it's a Zoom chat, right? Oh, sorry. Yes, uh, I accidentally sent it to uh, only a single person. Sure. Uh, here you. it is. So with this command, data like create, you have created a new um, directory on this file system here, a new data led data set. The main command for data led create uh, actually only needs this um, name, which is the name of the directory or data set that is to be created. Um, we're extending this here with an option that you will learn a little later about the dash C or config option, which applies a special procedure um, that I will not talk about too much right now but it contains a little bit of configuration to determine how the version control tools in this data set work. Now, the data set that we've just created is a join Git and Git Annex repository. So uh, do feel free to um, execute those next few commands here. Um, the first one is cd, change directories into this data set so that you actually now are inside of it um, on your file system. And then you can do a list command with the option dash a, which is short for all, um, to display all of the files that are in this directory. And what you can see here is that there are a couple of hidden files. Uh, on Unix systems, you have these dot files um, it's, it's a concept of files being hidden by default. They're used for configuration files. And a data set has a couple of these dot files, also dot directories, and they indicate that even though this looks like a normal directory, I can also open it here in the file browser, 
um, because the dot files do not show up um, unless I, I list them explicitly all. Uh, they are hidden, but these dot files indicate there are version control tools uh, at work. And uh, whatever you do, don't delete them. Uh, that would be detrimental. Um, but uh, this is an indication that version control is at work. And a data led data set, I've already told you this, is a Git and Git Annex repository. So at the core of this is a Git repository. Then there's a Git Annex repository wrapped around, and then data led adds a couple are functions uh, and commands that you can use in them, but it's just a version controlled directory. So- Can you maybe make your terminal font uh, a size bigger? Oh, definitely. Oh, I think it's- Better? I think so. Cool. So uh, let's- um... Wait, Did you go? Sorry? No, no, nothing, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's um, get an idea of what version control is for those who haven't used it by um, talking about version control from a local perspective, from an individual user. And uh, version control is useful for any individual outside of any kind of collaboration to keep things organized, to keep track of changes and revert changes uh, or go back to previous states of a data set. And this is the first feature version control, local version control that we're going to look at. Uh, and that is basically a feature that prevents the situation illustrated here by this comic. So data led knows two things, data sets and files. We already have a data set. Now we can put files inside of it. Um, and whatever file we put in there, it is version controlled all with the very same command. So what we're going to do now is um, to actually create um, a very simple file. Uh, and that file is a readme file. Um, if you scroll down to the section on version control, then uh, you have the instructions to create a text file readme.md. You can create this via all kinds of means. Uh, I am used to working solely from the command line. So I'm doing stuff like this. But you can also just click on this plus to, uh, no, not the plus, sorry. Um, directory new. Either file. right click here or file right. new something. Yeah, cool, thanks. So you can also create a new file, call it readme.md, uh, and then open it. And then I can open it with an editor. And now I'm putting some contents inside of it. I'm hitting control S to save. But if I were to use nano as it is instructed uh, from the terminal, I can uh, edit this um, file in a terminal editor. This terminal editor has a couple of shortcuts um, to save and close it. If you use nano, then you need to use control O to write the file, so to save it, and then control X to exit the editor and come back to your turn of terminal. The data set that we've created, it keeps track of everything that happens inside of it. And now that we have put a new file inside of it, uh, that is a status change. And this status change, uh, or any kind of status change, it can be viewed by running a command that's called data let status. Um, you can see that uh, when I run this command, it reports, uh, in this case, um, two files. Uh, one is residue of the, um, of the Jupyter Hub. So I'm quickly going to remove this file. It's a directory, so I'm going to RMR it. it. Um, and now this directory, this data, data set has exactly one new file, and this is called untracked because we haven't actually given it to the version control tools here um, to, to keep track of it. And the command to use to uh, save any um, file in your data sets is uh, data let save. Data let save has a very useful option that I advise you to make use of. It's the dash m short for dash dash message option uh, that you can 
um, used to append a short human readable description of what you have just saved. So if I run this, um, I have saved the file into my data set uh, in its current state so that data let status is what is called clean with nothing to save and a clean working directory. What we can do now is to take a look at the version history that has been recorded so far. It's really tiny, but um, if you type the word tick, that's git in reverse, a very useful little tool that you might need to install on your personal computer if you want to use it, but we can recommend it. Uh, you have a version history of everything that was done. You can see that you know, I'm John Doe now, but a couple of minutes ago, um, I created a new data set, and that's a command that we'll talk later about. But here you can see the most recent change to this data set, which is um, add a short readme. If I hit enter on this, um, on this line, uh, I can also get a more uh, extensive summary. This is the commit message, so the message that I have appended. Uh, I can see that it involved this file here, uh, which has new three new lines appended to it, and I can even see the additions that have been done to this data set. Has, if this hasn't worked for anyone, then please let me know. I will just briefly summarize uh, the version control that we've just seen here. So whatever file you put into a data set, even if it was just the small readme file, it can also be a different file regardless of size. When you run data, let's save, uh, this file in its current version will be saved into your data set. If it's an untracked file, it will be version controlled. If it's a modification, then this modification will be added to your version history. Um, we will continue by adding a couple of more files just to, just to um, get a muscle memory for that. Uh, and uh, this is where we start to develop a little toy use case, uh, which is a very um, small image analysis, basically, or image, image modification that we will run on JPEGs on uh, photography. Um, so what we'll do for in the next couple of commands, we'll add just a couple of JPEGs into our repository. And to keep that structured, uh, I will create a new directory and uh, add those files to it and version control them. Um, if you are also just currently in this tick software tool that shows you your um, version history, the uh, way to get out of it is by pressing Q, the, the letter Q, as often as needed to um, close all of the views that are open. Um, just the letter Q, as um, Michael already um, said in the chat. So what I'm, what I'm doing now is uh, I'm going to run the mkdir make directory command. Um, again, you can also do this here um, by uh, right-clicking um, in this um, file viewer here. Uh, and I'm going to create a directory, or rather two nested directories um, called inputs and images um, so that I have a little bit of structure in my data set. Um, here is, uh, so the first um, image that we're going to, to include in this, uh, in this data set comes from the web. And uh, I'm running a command from the terminal on your own computer. You can do this also just with any file browser, browser of your choice. wget is a command that takes a URL and downloads it into this output directory that I'm giving it here. And if I now run this tree command that I've already mentioned, then um, you can see the directory structure that this has created and how there is a new file in, this, uh, in these two directories. I can also open up them uh, in my uh, Jupyter Hub. This is a little bit Let's see if I can make this smaller. So what we've downloaded is this cute little image 
of a penguin are three penguins. And it's a little bit too large. So the image viewer uses minus and plus or actually minus or equals to, to scale the image. Uh, if you do the standard control plus, you scale oh. all the Jupiter. Thanks. All right. Um, and just to be very kind to any other fellow human that maybe receive this, this data set later, maybe we share it with them. Um, we also do another addition to this data set, and that is a little bit of information on what structure to expect in this data set and add it to the readme. It's good practice to just have these human readable files uh, in your data set that um, help uh, fellow humans to navigate. Uh, so um, you can basically add uh, any data um, that you that you want, uh, any any uh, text that you want, you can copy it. Uh, in, I'm just saying that there are penguin photos in inputs and images. And now I probably have created a little mess with Nano. Uh, just doing it from Nano because I like it more. And this is the wrong terminal. Control O for save, Control X to stop. So uh, this, if you've um, done both the download of the uh, penguin image and the modification of the readme file, then you have several modifications in your data set right now. We have a new file in untracked directories and we have a file that is already known to version control tools, but uh, it has been modified. So if we run data let status, you can see um, several untracked things and the checkpoints. Michael, do you know uh, a way in which I can tell JupyterHub to not create those files? I don't know how to tell JupyterHub how to not create it, but we can uh, we can probably tell Git uh, and DataLab to ignore this file. Yeah. With Git ignore. Yes, yes, yes. I'll, I'll skip that for now. Um, I might just save it uh, as residue. Um, yeah, it's, it's a bit inconvenient. Sorry about that. Now, um, the important um, the important information about data let save is that if you don't uh, apply any further um, specification to it, it will save every single modification or untracked file it finds in your directory. So running data let's save on a directory full of data will save all of the data. That is not always a good practice because as you will see when we um, interact with the history a bit, you want to create a Git history that is very intuitively structured in a way that each individual save, each individual commit uh, contains a standalone change uh, that if need be, can be reverted without, for example, affecting other files of your data set or uh, other, um, other work that has been done in your data set. So the modification of the readme, the addition of additional context uh, is completely independent of this new um, penguin file that you have added. So in order to save a single modification, um, you can simply append the path to the specific file that you want to change, uh, that you want to save in your data let's save call. Um, so here again, I'm adding a commit message and then also a path to the penguin image. And that will have saved only the penguin image. And now to only save the readme file, uh, you can see that I have also this untracked directory from Jupyter in here. Uh, I'm also um, creating a data let's save with a commit message and a path to the readme file. Okay, so to, um, 
just um, quickly summarize that in case you have been working with Git beforehand, um, the data led API that I've just shown you makes version control a little bit easier than with Git because whatever you do to the data set, whether it's creating new files, whether it's modifying existing files, um, whatever it is, a data led safe um, version controls it. And uh, as to reiterate the advice, it's useful to save meaningful units of change, standalone units of change, and it's also useful to attach helpful commit messages so that this uh, commit message, um, uh, the, the revision history of your data set has a nice, uh, very human friendly summary of everything uh, that has been done. Um, if you then want to use these features on your own system, uh, for your next uh, data acquisition. Uh, then you can use this to not only version control penguin images, but you can also use it to version control really large data. There is no upper limit for file size here. Uh, if you have a terabyte uh, sized file, it's completely fine to data, let's save it. Um, now, I'm already displaying it here in this tick um, overview. The revision history that we are building up here is very, very useful if done right, because it can become, especially in the context of research, a complete research log that captures everything that you have done. And uh, with time passing, it will be very useful to be able to go back into this research log to actually find out what has been done. And because this also works for large files, you can extend this to um, larger, larger data sets, uh, experimental uh, results, and so forth. And uh, at the end of this session, we're going to also show you how to interact with this history a bit. The next um, feature that we're going to, to um, preview a bit is um, provenance tracking. Um, that, uh, that includes um, the or, uh, rec recording the origin of files that you retrieve um, from the web. Uh, but before that, let's maybe that stop here. Question, uh, we have a right? nice question in chat and we have a raised hand. So uh, maybe let's start with chat. Mm -hmm. uh, can you build commits like in Git, add files before deciding to save so that you can be more specific as to which files to include? Do you want to or shall I? Um, maybe you. Um, so what Lucas is referring to here is, I think, um, what is in Git called the staging area, um, where which is basically a pre-stage um, where you can add all kinds of files or specific changes um, that are then um, saved. Uh, you can do this not with solely data led commands. So data led skips the the staging area, but you can do it with purely git commands if you want to. Uh, so a git add works exactly um, as you um, as you would expect it, and then you can git commit. Uh, you can also data let save. Wait, so I can uh, add files with git and then use data that's safe instead of git commit? In principle. OK, cool. It doesn't make version control easier, though. So you still have to. I mean, if, but if you're, if, you're, if you're used to using git, then by all means. I, could, I can use git in the data lab data set, and it would still show up in the data lab history. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Cool. It's just it's just that you should not use git add for your um, nifty images. So um, uh, we'll talk about this uh, in in the in the session on the version control details um, in more detail. But uh, yeah, but any kind of thing that you would normally use git for, like um, your code, if you want to, if you want to stage, like with, when you use git add p to to just include chunks of modifications uh, in your manuscript and so forth, that's perfectly possible. Um, is there a raised hand still? 
Yes. So um, what's the flag next to the name in the Tigris history? Uh, the flag next to the name, which- The O and the I, what, what does that mean? Um, oh, this thing. Exactly, yes. Um, this is a visualization of um, the development history uh, of the uh, of the data set of the Git repository. Uh, we'll have a session on branching later today. Uh, and once we include several branches in data sets, this will not only be O's and I's, but you will see a little tree-like structure that branches out uh, and will give you an overview of um, basically independent development histories that mm -hmm. you can you can have in, in Git repositories. Um, but that's uh, that's going to be a little bit more clear in, in one or two hours. Thank you. But as far as I understand, the O's are meant to be visual more than yeah. uh, more than anything. And then basic question, log of changes stored locally within the dot files. Can you export the log as a file? Uh, I've never tried to export a git log. Uh, you can certainly just write it out um, and then copy it. That's completely possible. Um, the way that it is stored internally is more complex than just a single text file though. Um, yeah. But nothing speaks against, for example, writing all of the contents that you can see here into a text file automatically, and then you have it also. Uh, and if you publish your data sets to Git, for example, then you also have a nice web-based visualization. So I'm running terribly late. Uh, I will... So maybe for a short comment, we will use this as an opportunity to say that TIG is just a program for previewing the history and the commit messages. Uh, the Git log is the more standard but less visually appealing way to do the same but then you can also add some formatting whether you want one line format or longer or or whatever um okay so i'll um try to make up for uh, my slowness a little bit um by um continuing with the next command that we're going to use. That is a data let command that will be used to download another um, photo from the web. Previously, uh, I've used wget to do this. Data let download URL has a couple of advantages when adding any kind of file that um, originally comes from the web. If I um, run this command, what data let does internally is not only downloading this file and saving it underneath this um, new directory, you can see it um, being added here in this overview as well. It will also automatically create a commit about this. Uh, data that status will show um, just the stupid Jupyter checkpoints, but no um, new or untracked um, image. And you can see that there was a save happening. Uh, if I go and take a look in the um, history, you can see that DataLad has created a commit on its own and included a commit message that's called download URLs. And it includes the URL where this came from in the commit message, but importantly, and you will see this also a little bit later, it not only includes this in the commit history, it also created a currently invisible um, and uh, uh, not yet relevant, uh, but relevant later, entry about where this um, file has come from, and it will be able to automatically re-download it uh, whenever you need it. Um, so that uh, is the first bit of digital provenance that um, adds information on the origin of files to your data set. And just a comment while here we are downloading uh, imaging from Unsplash that is uh, a, a collection of permissively licensed uh, photographs that make for nice wallpapers or for nice presentation images. Uh, we, we like to feature download URL because it is the same command that you would be using for, uh, for many online repositories of research data. Uh, so you can imagine that this being this coming from this being a data data coming from from a public source, 
And there's, uh, there's a similar comment uh, at URLs that we won't cover today, but it's, it's for bulk downloads. So to just uh, summarize the commands that we've uh, included so far, um, the data let create command creates you an empty data set, which you can use to version control files. We have create, uh, used it with a configuration and those configurations are really useful, even though I haven't told you why yet. Um, the data set that you create with this command has a history and um, this history is um, what's called a Git history. So you can explore it with Git. Um, that's uh, with the command git log. It's not as pretty as tick, um, but you can also use external tools. If you're uh, using any other external tools, um, you can, they, they work just as well in data sets. Um, the data let save command is the command that you use um, as a data let um, core API command to record data sets or file states to the history. Um, you should add commit messages that summarize your changes in order to create a human readable um, history in your data set. Um, data let download URL is a command that um, includes a data let save command. Uh, and what it does, it you can give it any URL and it obtains the web content and then also records where this has come from uh, in a commit message and internally. Uh, and then data let status is a very useful command that uh, will give you an idea of um, what is the current state of your data set. It's really useful to run it frequently. You've seen me being confused by those untracked files repeatedly. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's always useful to run data let status before you save, else it can happen that you just are not aware of some untracked files that you then um, save uh, accidentally. Um, the next um, parts of the code, uh, in, in the workshop, uh, they um, are minor. We can um, we can we can skip them, but uh, you can use them to just uh, yeah practice data let saving uh, a little bit more. Uh, what we do in a bits inspired fashion is to not only have the image files of our photographies in our data set, but also add some what is called sidecar files that include useful um, metadata to the uh, to the to the contents of our data set. If you're working with neuroimaging data, then you might use the bit standard, which has um, been a great um, beacon of including uh, all of the metadata that is necessary for others to understand uh, what is happening or what, what certain images are about, uh, brain images, and making them machine readable in standardized formats so that tools can automatically use them. Um, I'll quickly just um, do that and you can follow along if you want to. Um, what uh, this adds is just, uh, metadata about the photographer, the license, and the penguin count uh, in each data set for each of the two files in what is called a YAML file. It's a common way of structuring um, metadata with these changes. I have so many untracked files uh, that I can now data let's save. And I will include uh, paths to these specific files because I don't want to save the uh, Jupyter Hub residue. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this little star here because I'm lazy and I don't want to type two paths. So this will save both files because it matches the description. Um, okay. So if there are any questions, then please uh, feel free to, to just ask them. Uh, in case you don't have any questions, I have a question for you that you can use. I actually have a question, sorry. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so these YAML files, is it totally arbitrary? What kind of um, 
keys and values you put in there, or is there some kind of um, uh, well set that you can use? Uh, it's completely arbitrary. Uh, okay. It's just it's just the structure, and it's also just an arbitrary format that we used mainly due to its human readability. Um, all right. Yes. Yeah, so most people, uh, all of the people that are participating. Uh, have this question uh, correctly, uh, commit hash is a 40 character string identifying changes. And I want to um, use a minute to um, talk about the uh, elements that uh, commit um, in a revision history has because it will become relevant for the next brief session. So the commit hash, the 40 character string is this gibberish that is right here. Uh, this is a string that uniquely identifies uh, any um, save, any commit in uh, your data set. And it is very important uh, because it can be used to interact with a specific parts of your history or specific commits. Um, there are other means to identify commits. Um, we'll talk about them on the next slide. Um, and that enters the realm of time traveling uh, and the um, commands that are useful to interact with the history and reset it to specific st um, states. That's very useful um, also, also, uh, also already for local version control because whatever you do, um, the mistakes that you might make while doing it are not forever anymore. Whatever past changes you have made in a data set, they can be transparently uh, undone. So if you've written some code and it turns out to not work, then you can undo them. If you have deleted some code and you really want to have it back, you can have it back uh, really easily. Uh, and you can also become a time bender. It requires a little bit of Git knowledge, but uh, when you've mastered it, then you can travel back in time, rewrite history, and basically time is fluent and uh, fluid and at your disposal. And for, for this, it's uh, quite handy to understand in what ways Git assigns IDs and, and so-called refs or references. And uh, one way uh, it does this, so one way you can identify a specific change that you might want to interact with um, it is this commit sha, this character string. Typically, you don't need to copy or type all of this. The first six characters are um, unique enough so that you can uh, uh, so that you can limit yourself to, to only including these first six ones. A different um, type of reference is what is called branch names. It's going to come in the session afterwards. Um, but common branch names that you find in datasets are either main um, or master. Those master is was the old default, main is the new default, depending on your Git version, uh, depending on your configurations. Um, this, this will differ. You can see that this thing here is a master branch, so it's called master, and I could refer um, to the changes um, onto this branch, on this branch with, um, with this name here. There are also tags. Those are just labels that I can give to commits in software development, for example, it's uh, standard to include a version identifier as a tag like v01. Um, and then there is stuff that is called head, which is a little bit weird, but a head is what is called a pointer, a little um, reference to the most recent commit on the branch that you're currently on. So my head currently points to this commit on the master branch. And if I were to, um, for example, run git show, it shows me a commit on head, I will see the most recent commit, but I can also use notation like this to go back in time. So this is head minus one. Uh, and then uh, I will see the commit before that and head minus two, the commit before that. So this is also one way to refer to changes in a data set. Uh, here is um, a little bit more complex stuff from VL repository. Here you can see that there is um, more 
than just a master branch. You can see that the branch name here is different. Uh, you can still see a commit ID, there's no tag. Um, and this is something yeah, that can be, all of these can be used to refer to, to specific changes or ranges of changes. Um, in order to uh, follow through with the next commands, um, you need to go to uh, the the dip, dip, bottom middle middle of the page, uh, and that's called breaking things uh, and repairing them. And in order to um, break things and repair them, uh, let's actually uh, break things. So um, back in your Jupyter Hub, you can uh, open up the README file that you've so meticulously version controlled and simply remove everything from it. Uh, for example, if you've done an accidental save or control A, delete, um, I'm saving this file, I'm going out of the editor and if I run data let status, I can see that it is modified. And if I can, if I run then um, a command that's called git diff that shows me the difference between the most recent version state and the current state of files, uh, then I can see that all of the contents of my precious readme have been removed. This happens often. Sometimes you have uh, changes that um, you actually didn't want to have could also be accidental new lines and files. And um, one command that you can use as a convenience to um, revert or to reset a currently modified file to the state it used to be in before or in the last, in the last recent commit, um, that uh, is called uh, git restore. So if I run, and this is just as a heads up, a kind of um, destructive command or a, a dangerous command, but if I run git restore readme uh, and then take a look at the contents of the readme, they uh, have reappeared. Now, uh, it is dangerous because in case these modifications here were not destructive. Let's say I have, wouldn't have deleted everything, but I would have made useful additions. But where to run git restore? This is one of the very few git commands that cannot be undone. It cannot be transparently redone. It cannot, whatever you lose with git restore can, can, cannot come back to life in no way. Um, but it is a very useful feature for people that um, are a little bit lazy. Uh, like me, so I uh, wanted to I wanted to say uh, to to show you that. Uh, and now uh, to break things a little bit more, if I open up the README again, and now I'm doing a really bad addition to this that doesn't really make sense. This might be um, this might be a script, and I'm fucking up a function, um, or it might be um, participant information, and I'm um, changing uh, valid information to wrong information, whatever it is, it's a bad addition. But now I'm saving it. So I'm saving a bad addition. And now it is part of the version history uh, of my data set. And a couple of weeks, days later, I might think, oh shit, that's, that's been really bad. What I can do in order to um, unbreak things is to run a command that's called git revert. And git revert is a nice command because it's so transparent. Uh, git revert transparently reverts what has been done in a past commit. And it also saves this to the version history so that you can even revert, uh, re revert. <laughs> The one thing that you need for this is you need the identifier of the commit or the range of commits that you would want to revert. And in this case here, yours will be different. So you need to do this yourself. Um, I'm actually going to uh, run git show so that I can 
um, do this um, all on the same screen. If I run git revert of this first few bits of the commit shell, then I'm also adding this uh, option here that's called no edit um, that um, simply tells git I don't want to create a, an individual commit message. It's fine if git just creates its default. Um, then the contents of the readme are restored to what they were and the revision history has a new commit that was done under my name um, that transparently uh, undoes what has been done in the past. And I can then uh, also take the commit identifier of this revision here, uh, of this commit, and revert it as well. If I then figure out, ah, no, it's actually, it was a good addition. addition. It was actually useful that I removed this function or that I added this parameter and so forth. Um, there are a couple of commands that uh, you will see later, and that is um, git checkout. Git checkout is a command that will be used for basically time traveling. Um, and then there are commands that I really want to mention. They are a little bit out of scope here, but very, very useful to know. Um, if you um, ever want to really get into the topic of time traveling and Git history re rewriting and, and bending, then I encourage you to read about the commands Git rebase and Git reset. Those are commands that you can use to actually change or rewind history without creating yeah. these transparent commits. It's not in all cases recommended because the revision history is a very valuable thing to have. Um, but there are certainly very valid use cases where you really want to get rid of a commit or where you really want to, for example, reorder the, um, the, the commits that you have made. So just to register these commits with you, they're called the base and reset. And then um, there is a command that I want to share with you that is not so well known even among Git users. Uh, and that's a little bit of a lifesaver um, because working with Git repositories, especially when you um, are interested in using Git and then explore a little bit, um, there are complex operations that can also go wrong. But as long as everything is saved, there is a command that can undo everything that has been done wrongfully. And that is what is called the git ref log. It's a time limited um, um, log of everything that has been done. And if there's anything in your revision history or in like your, your terminal history that turned out to be not what you intended to run or had consequences that you didn't anticipate, you can undo basically uh, every mistake uh, with it. Um, sorry, no, there's a little bit, sorry. <laughs> and uh, the only two commands that git ref log can not uh, restore or the only actions where, where git ref log cannot save you if something goes wrong. So you should be, should be quite mindful uh, in using them. The one is git restore and the other one is, is git clean. Uh, I can actually show you what git clean does. It's uh, also for lazy people. Um, I'm going to um, run it with three flags. I'm going to show you what they do later. Um, the N flag is a um, uh, dry run flag that will not actually execute the command, but simply report what it would do. Um, git clean is a command that cleans up your repository from untracked files. Uh, so if you run this with files that you haven't saved yet, but that are important, don't run it. Um, but in this case, I have these stupid untracked files and I just want to get rid of them. Um, and so I can run git clean. Um, D stands for remove directories, F stands for remove files. So if I run this now, it has removed those files and I have a clean status again. But again, it's it's kind of a yeah, destructive things. So, so be a little bit careful about it. Um, I have a question. Yeah, so if you have any questions now, um, please feel free to ask them. We'll go into a short break uh, afterwards and you can occupy uh, or entertain yourself with a multiple choice question 
um, while we wait for questions, if 